Now you'll be happy to know that uh, this is our only bright yellow slide. Um, we're now getting into the part of uh, the training where we talk about the process for assisting each type of applicant that, uh, that I'd introduced you to this morning. And I chose bright yellow for this slide because it's the dawn of a new day with helping a whole lot of different types of uh, applicants. You'll notice in your PowerPoint, as well as right up here, uh, that there's this funny looking frame that is uh, on the slide for each new type of applicant that we're dealing with. Uh, it was my intention to kind of try to bring a little order to this PowerPoint so it's a little bit easier to read through if you're just looking at that paper copy. Uh, over the next many slides, we're going to be talking about assisting those who were, my term, formally ineligible. Applicants formerly known as ineligible, but who may very well now be uh, eligible for assistance. And so as I talk about the process for assisting these folks, some of what I'm saying is going to be applicable to even other applicants uh, that, that we'll talk about each in turn, but that's the reason why this one type of applicant has a whole lot of slides that are devoted to it. And so here's one thing that you may or may not know. Um, in Counselor Direct, you're able to do a number of different types of searches. You can search based on uh, your applicant's uh, status or, or their name or their email address, but um, one type of search that you can't do, you, you can also search for all those applicants who have the status ineligible. But do you know you cannot search for who was ineligible for the specific reason of their mortgage origination date? We don't have the ability to do such a fine search as that, but Florida housing staff does. And so I want to recognize that when it comes to assisting those who are formally ineligible, the first step of identifying who those folks are, who those folks are that are most likely eligible now, we need to wait for Florida housing staff to do the first uh, search, search your agency's list of applicants and say, who was it that was deemed ineligible solely because of their mortgage origination date, 180 days past due, the condo business, the combined loan to value. These are the folks on this list that you'll soon receive from Florida Housing. These are the folks you probably need to make contact with uh, sooner rather than later because they may very well be getting hardest hit assistance soon. So the first step is contacting these applicants and recognize something you may already know Florida Housing has already sent out to all applicants in Hardest Direct, has sent out a message that basically said, you may have heard that the Hardest Hit program has changed. Please do not reapply, okay? Just on the front end, we, we wanted to make sure to kind of uh, stop that before it even started. There's no reason for anybody who's already started an application to go back and type in their name and email address again and try to do a new application. Now, uh, most recently, Florida Housing has just sent out a second email to uh, our formerly ineligible applicants, uh, noting, hey, the hardest hit program has changed and you need to get back in touch with the advisor that you had worked with previously. Get back with them, see if you're maybe eligible now. So by the time that you, as the advisor, are contacting this applicant, they've already received some previous contacts, your main message when you first contact them probably should be something like, recognize, I'm going to help you, collect, I'm going to collect some information from you, you may be eligible for assistance, nothing is definite yet, nothing is guaranteed, I need to collect some information from you to see if you might now be eligible. Okay, so that's the first step is contacting these applicants. And now, in the second step, that's when it's time to collect the documents that show whether or not they are currently eligible. Now, there's a lot of text on this slide, but this is text that we've already gone through. I just wanted to repeat 
all the different documents that we had already talked about before the break, all the new stuff that you have to collect from an applicant to prove that right now they're eligible. And one of the first things that I, uh, I, I want to point out is, um, look at that last bullet point here, updated eligibility computation form. Okay. Uh, well, it's not only do you need to update the computation form, uh, but what that also means is that form is now, uh, has now been slightly revamped. I want to show you a couple screenshots of it. I think it's, uh, it's new and, and definitely improved. The top third of this uh, form, it's a one-page form, the top third of it now has a new layout for how you add information about income. I, uh, I'm not showing you all of the top third of it, but there are now six different places where you can add a household member's name and what type of income they have and the amount of that income. I'll demonstrate this in just a minute. But before I do, I'll show you the, the middle third of this form, which has a green section that adds together, that summarizes all of the income information, but it also has a gray section towards the left there that allows you to list what are the assets of the borrower or co-borrower. Remember, we're only interested in documenting the assets of the borrower or co-borrower, not any other household members. The bottom third of this form, just like it was in the past, the bottom third of the form deals with other eligibility tests. Okay? And one of the tests has been deleted, the test about the combined loan to value. Hey, that test has been eliminated, so there's no need uh, for that anymore. Uh, but, uh, you know, it looks a little bit different. Some of the text is a little bit bigger, uh, but uh, uh, that's been slightly updated. One thing that hasn't been updated, though, is at the very bottom of it, there's still a place that automatically calculates the partial payment based on the income information that you've added uh, up front. And so let me take a second. I want to actually demonstrate this in action. So let me pull up that uh, spreadsheet. Here it is, right here. Um, we're looking at the top part of the eligibility computation form here. And uh, I'm just going to, just by way of demonstrating, <clears throat> let me type in the name of somebody, like John. Uh, how about John Doe? And when it comes time to add the the source of income, look at this handy dandy new feature, a pull down menu of different options, whether it's uh, salary or child support, let's say we have a salaried employee. Go ahead and say, ooh, ah, <laughs> no, this is real nice. Um, so it saves you a little bit of data entry here. And uh, so you'll type in uh, the, you know, the date and uh, the, the gross pay, let's say uh, it's I don't know, $500. Um, and the pay periods are, let's get the number of pay periods in here, also a pull down uh, menu. Uh, let's say it's uh, every other week payments. Um, so that's one source of income. Let's say there's another household member named Jane Doe that has another source of income. Maybe um, she gets uh, child support, maybe from a previous uh, marriage. And uh, oh, that's $200 every uh, month. So the pay periods are 12 pay periods in a year. You can see over to the right, there's another place where I could add another person's income. Hey, let's say Grandma Doe is getting a uh, source of Social Security <coughs> income. And let's say that's um, 675 every month. So you get the idea. Data entry is a little bit reduced because of these pull-down menus. And now as we scroll down to the middle of the page, we see that the names of those individuals that I just typed in, they've automatically come over here, and all this information is summarized here. But now, let's say in this case, John and Jane Doe were borrower and co-borrower on this uh, uh, property. Uh, now, if I want to, let's say that both John and Jane have some assets that I've got to report. 
Now I don't have to type in their name. I mean, after all, I typed in their name. So here they are. Here's John, and here is his, let's see, he has a checking account, and um, let's say that it's got $2,000 in it. So, you know, the data entry here is also very, very nicely arranged. Let's say Jane has a savings account. So that gives you an idea of how that part works right there. And then uh, down here, let's see what else I'm going to tell you about here. So I, I'm not going to go through all the details of this. You can see that some of these fields have already been uh, filled in, the asset test. And uh, um, I think I want to show you that at the very bottom, something that, I, that was actually not on my screenshot uh, that I showed you just a minute ago, there's uh, the information about the partial payment. There's also the flip side information about how much money hardest hit will pay for every time a UMAP payment is made. Let's recognize that this form is one that the advisor fills out before you export an eligible case to Florida Housing. This is also the same form that Florida Housing staff uses. The underwriting staff also uses it. So that's, that would explain why this field right here about what is the hardest hit uh, payment every month. That's a helpful piece of information for them to know so that they can provide the proper amount of uh, monthly UMAP assistance. Is there a way to do irregular uh, income periods? That pull down chart. The answer is yes. Uh, Nicole, I guess you would unprotect the spreadsheet, add a new payment period in, is that right? You could do that, or if it, I mean, it, I guess how irregular are the payments? You well, could, if you're dealing with seasonal workers, yeah. or, or, you know, there's a lot of things that just don't fit the mold that we've dealt with. I think you would do then, um, wouldn't it be, but by, It'd be one time, time two, two weeks. I mean, you put in. I mean, they might get paid one month and then two months later be a different amount. It's not a recurring dollar. It's not yeah, but you would still put it. So you got paid this one week and then three weeks later you got paid this and two weeks later you got paid this. You put them all in and then you annualize it out by using the 52. Okay, so in other words, just do a whole long string of them. Right. There are six places to add that in. Let's recognize there may be the occasional applicant that has more sources of income than six uh, which are on this form. So, you know, at times you may find that you need to have some sort of addendum to this form where you really list out all the details. But, you know, you make a good point, Debbie, about how some folks have kind of odd jobs. Several different folks are... Are, uh, are paying them and that's how they get by. And uh, as we've said in previous workshops, in a case like that, we're asking for, well, tell me, what was your income in the last two months? Uh, oh, you had five different employers that were paying you for different odd jobs and you'd collect all those sources of income for the last two months and you'd use that to inform how much you estimate is gonna be received over the course of a 12-month period of time. So to reiterate what Nicole was saying, uh, you, you, you add together all the sources of income, you annualize it, and if you need to, you can add some addendum to this form. For the most part, though, for the, the most you common know, types of applicants like that we're working with, they have much more have predictable and fewer put, sources of income you, you, you that can, can all fit the form, into this you know, one the six page month eligibility. Profit and loss was, you know, three thousand dollars. Well, then. Uh, you know, divide that by six, and then times that by twelve. I mean, you could you could get there with the four to to do different things like that. If you if anybody finds that they really need this extra number of weeks in there or something, I can do that. That's not a problem. But I think, like Michael said, we covered most scenarios with this. Uh, tomorrow, as a follow-up to this workshop, I'm going to be sending everybody an electronic copy of the PowerPoint as well as this eligibility computation form. Although I think that it's, it's on the admin portal for Counselor Direct, this new updated form, but uh, hey, you know, there should be some benefits for coming to a workshop, so you'll get that in your email tomorrow. <laughs> oh boy, let's hope there's more benefits, huh?
You want the valuable prizes for the exercise this afternoon. <laughs> um, now, among the forms that you have to collect uh, for those who were formally declared ineligible uh, is a form that I have not mentioned yet. It's a brand new form. It's on the, uh, the uh, admin portal on Counselor Direct. And this form is called Notice to Current and Previous Participants in the Hardest Hit Program. Uh, I've given you a, a screenshot of this, uh, of this form, but here's, here's the bottom line. You can see that I've, I've put a quote in here. I understand that the hardest hit assistance available to me is limited to what is listed in this notice. We want to make sure that those who have previously or are currently receiving assistance understand the program has changed. Here's the changes. It's all listed on this page, and then they sign at the bottom of this. So, uh, so th this is a very helpful thing to just make sure that it's crystal clear what a person can expect from their hardest hit assistance going forward. All right, now this next step is dealing with uh, the changes to eligibility criteria. You'll notice that the color of this slide has changed, so all the things that I'm about to tell you that are related to eligibility changes are going to be on some green slides here, so we keep some uh, uniformity to the different topics on this PowerPoint. And so let's talk about this, um, in no particular order, let's talk about the condo change first. Okay? So it's no longer the case that you have to check uh, if somebody is on the FHA or the Fannie Mae condo list. Not, not only do you not have to, don't do it, okay? It's, it's, it's nothing that you need to waste your time on. Instead, the first thing you should do when working with a condo owner, and again, remember, all of these steps that we're talking about now are when you're working with somebody who is formally ineligible, okay? So we're looking here at somebody who is maybe declared ineligible because they were not on the condo list. Okay, don't go back and look at that condo list. Now, go to the admin portal of Counselor Direct, and just to define my terms here, when I say admin portal, when you first sign on to Counselor Direct as an, as an advisor, this is the first page that you see. Okay? It's the page that has these updated notices. Sometimes Florida Housing will write. And on the right-hand side of the page, there's a whole list of documents that you can download. One of them is the eligibility computation form we just talked about. And you're also going to see among those items listed a new document. I don't think it's on there right now, but soon enough we will start a new document called something like the, the Healthy Condos List. The idea is still... With condo owners, we want to make sure that their condo is in a, a healthy financial state uh, so that going forward, it really makes sense for us to invest new money, in this case, hardest hit money, to assist the homeowner there. Uh, the most extreme case I can give you is, uh, what if we had a condo owner living in a building with 100 condo units, but all of them have been foreclosed on, they've all been abandoned except for one unit? Well, um, it's a very extreme case, but you get the sense by, by mentioning it that way, we would not want to help that condo uh, uh, owner because, um, you know, we might be able to help him or her with the monthly mortgage payment, but what happens the next time that there's an assessment to fix the roof or something else in the common area or whatever? You think one person's going to be able to handle the whole bill for a 100-unit property? That's why we're getting to this question of what is a healthy condo. What is a condo that is in a financially healthy uh, position? So sometimes uh, you can benefit from the fact that other advisors are working with other applicants that are living in that same condo and maybe Florida Housing already knows that that condo is a healthy condo. So check the healthy condo list and it might be that simple. You might see the name of your condo and you're like, check this person passes the condo test, but very likely, at least in the first couple of months, that condo list is not going to have a whole lot of condos listed on it. And it's going to be up to advisors to ask their applicants to provide uh, financial statements, two years of financial statements, from their condo association. Now, on the surface of it, I, 
I don't know anything about condo association financial statements. I've never really had to think about that. So let me give you a little bit of details of what I've learned on that. So the, 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 the applicant is the one who's responsible for getting these documents and scan them into the counselor direct system, two years worth of them. It is the, you'll be happy to know, it's the underwriter over at Florida Housing that's actually going to look at these documents, okay? So the advisor's responsibilities when it comes to condos, it's not really all that difficult. You just got to... ...collect two documents that you used to not collect. Okay? But it will be the underwriter that, that actually that looks at those documents and assesses whether the financial situation of this condo association is, is healthy and acceptable or not. Okay? And just in case you were wondering, there is a Florida law that requires condo associations to create these annual financial statements. Okay? So in every case of a condo owner, it should not be hard to get a copy of these financial statements. Here's some more detail on this next page. It's an overwhelming amount of text, but let's go through it here. First and most important thing to know is that a condo owner should easily be able to go to their association and get these financial statements for free, okay? So this should not be a big deal. The next thing I want you to know is that that Florida law that I just referenced, I just gave you the statutory uh, citing for it, um, that law requires more in-depth financial statements from larger condos than it does from smaller condos. And so you can see here in the bullet points uh, that, that an association that has more than $400,000 of revenue, which must be a fairly large condo, they're going to have to do a full blown out financial audit. But those between two hundred and four hundred thousand dollars of revenue need to do something that's of uh, lesser impact, a financial review. Um, going down the list here, those that are the smaller condos uh, simply have to do a, a financial report, not nearly as in depth as, uh, as an audit. And here's one thing right from the beginning which might be helpful for you and the applicant to know. If a condo has 50 or fewer units in it, all that is required is a, a financial report. So not a very you know, in-depth uh, financial statement. But, but in, in all cases, whether it's an audit, a review, a compilation, or a report, we can call those all financial statements that the applicant will have to get their hands on. Okay? They bring it to you, you upload it, end of story. Here's another change that we've seen to eligibility criteria. Now there's this uh, rule that you, you don't have to be uh, no more than 180 days late uh, in, or past due in paying your first mortgage. Now um, it does beg the question, okay, well now how late is too late? What is now considered too delinquent? And the answer is totally up to the servicer. The servicer is the one who's making this decision. Now their hands are not tied so much. They can look at individual circumstances. And this is very important for you to know, this final item on this slide. When it comes to servicers who are following Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac guidelines, they are essentially required to accept the hardest hit assistance uh, even if a person has started the legal foreclosure process, they have to accept hardest hit assistance all the way up to really the final stage of the legal foreclosure process where you're putting a home up for a foreclosure sale. Okay? So anywhere up to seven days before that sale, the servicer needs to kind of stop. Again, these are servicers that are following Fannie and Freddie guidelines. They need to stop, look at the situation, and very likely say, we're going to put off on the legal foreclosure process during the time when we accept hardest hit assistance. So don't be surprised if you see a case where the person is tens of thousands of dollars past due, where the legal foreclosure process has started. Don't be surprised if somebody like that becomes eligible for hardest hit. 
when the servicer says, yeah, yeah, we'll accept hardest hit. Because I expect that that will happen more than we've seen it before. Oh, here's a question from some uh, applicant who uh, it, it has a question related to that. So I was turned down when the servicer deemed me too far delinquent. Should the advisor still reassess my case? Now, before we answer this, let me recognize what's going on in this situation. It's not every situation that's like this. This is an applicant who said that she was turned down by the servicer. So this means that the advisor looked at her case, she passed all the eligibility criteria, there was this question about the 180 days past due amount, but I guess it was close enough that an advisor said, well, I think this person's probably eligible, I'm gonna export this case up to Florida Housing. Okay, this doesn't always happen, uh, but in, in her situation, it was close enough that the advisor said, I better send this up for Florida Housing's underwriter and for the servicer to consider whether this person's eligible. I think she's eligible. Uh, and, and in this case, I guess in the past, the servicer said, nope, too far delinquent. So with all that said, should the advisor reassess her case? Most definitely yes, and let me tell you why. First of all, there's nothing automatic that the servicers are doing to reevaluate the situation of applicants like this woman, okay? Uh, you, and, and also recognize that hardest hit has changed very significantly, and now there's much more um, MLRP assistance that's now available. And so a servicer needs to make that decision again about whether this person is too far delinquent. Now maybe a person might have been too far delinquent if there's only $6,000 of MLRP available, but now there's three times that amount. And that will greatly influence more servicers to say, yes, this person is eligible now. So if you have cases that are like this, and you know, you might be thinking, well, it was never my decision. The servicer said that they were too far delinquent. Don't think that the servicer's automatically gonna reassess those cases. That is in your ballpark to, to deal with. So let's move along and talk about some other eligibility criteria. What about the change uh, to the combined loan to value test, to the mortgage origination test? There's not too many details that I really need to share with you except to remind you that before you can deem somebody who was formally ineligible as eligible, make sure that, they're in, that their ineligible letter lists, you know, only one or both of these as the only reasons why they're ineligible, right? You don't want to look at uh, a letter uh, and, and have it say something like, they failed the origination uh, test and they also uh, have an active bankruptcy. Because nothing's changed about active bankruptcies. If a person has a bankruptcy right now, they're, they're still ineligible. And there's one uh, last uh, change to the eligibility criteria that we have to talk about. It deals with the hardship test. And before we get to this underemployment hardship test, which has changed, let me start off by reminding you of, of, of things that have not changed, okay? So if a person is unemployed through no fault of their own, that's still a qualifying hardship. Nothing has changed there. Also, if a person says they have a hardship because there's a, you know, a death or a divorce or a disability in the family and that's why they're having a hard time paying their mortgage, those are still not qualifying hardships. Nothing has changed there. The change deals with underemployment hardships, which now must be documented as significant hardships, where there's a significant reduction of income, specifically 10% reduction at least. Uh, before I get into, I do have a couple of details to, to share about that, but um, I want to start off by first telling you about another change that it's like the you've, you've already heard about sometime in the last month, and it deals with temporary illness. A temporary illness can now be considered a qualifying hardship. So let me give you the details of this. It seems to fly in the face of what I just said in the last slide. So let me kind of distinguish this uh, from what I was just talking about. First of all, the only types of temporary illness that we're interested in is when the borrower or the co-borrower is the one experiencing the illness. Okay? And when we talk about, you know, emphasis is on temporary, 
because the idea is that a person is not able to do their job now, but they're going to come back to that job. There is the intention of returning back to work. And so consider the final bullet point of this slide where I give you a couple of examples. Sometimes a person might be temporarily ill, like this dude right here, because he got into a car accident. He got into some sort of accident uh, that was not his fault. Remember, a temporary illness where you're not at fault. And, and that's why, you know, you've got to recover from your accident and then you'll return to work. In a case like that, maybe the person uh, is not getting paid while they're out of work, or maybe the, um, the compensation that they're receiving right now is, is at a lesser amount than their regular pay is. So in cases like that, somebody might really financially be suffering, and that's why they've got a qualifying hardship. But I want to contrast that to a different type of accident that a person can get in. What if you're driving under the influence of drugs or alcohol, and you smash into somebody else, and it's totally your fault. Well, that would not be a temporary illness that's a qualifying hardship. It has to be something that you're not at fault of. And in a similar way, talking about fault or no fault, uh, consider that a person might be out of work because they're pregnant, and a person, a woman, might be uh, out of work because she's pregnant, she's going to be delivering her child. Um, in a case like that, that would also not count for this temporary illness that I'm talking about here because, you know, for the most part, you choose uh, uh, to get pregnant. And so that doesn't quite fall into the category of what we're talking about here. We're mostly talking about a person who's, who's injured, needs to recover, and is getting back to work. Okay. So this is some helpful details on something that was talked about within this last month on one of our advisors' calls. A question about that? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, you know, they're out of work for, a, I'm going to repeat what you said there, they're out of work for uh, a, a while, uh, but they actually lose that job because their, employment, uh, their employer terminates their employment. Uh, so um, uh, I'll answer part of this, and you, you might want to uh, jump in here too. Um, so they're, they're going to likely file for unemployment uh, compensation, and they'll likely get it, right, Nicole? Yeah, and that would document that it's at no fault of their own if they're able to get unemployment uh, benefits. Any more to add to that? No, I think that that's exactly correct. <laughs> I mean, if you can't get unemployment benefits, you can get the third party from the, the past employer, the, the job was eliminated or, or whatever. But yeah, that under that scenario, it seems likely that they would qualify. Other questions about that? Yeah. How far back are we going with the accident? Okay, yeah, so that's a, that's a good question. Um, how, how long ago did the accident or the temporary illness occur uh, before you can no longer say this is a qualifying hardship? Um, so there's actually no, <clears throat> there's no date that we have, there's no limit that, that's uh, placed on it by the hardest hit program. Uh, let's, let's recognize that there is ultimately one final date. The, the temporary illness could not have occurred before they originated their mortgage right? Because <laughs> then it wouldn't, have, it wouldn't have been a reason for them to suffer falling behind on their mortgage. Um, and uh, the farther back that it goes, you ha the advisor has to keep in their mind, well, how is it, since back when they had that hardship, how is it that they've been able to, uh, to, to still get by, financially to get by? Uh, maybe they haven't been able to pay their mortgage or whatever, but the farther back that it goes, that becomes a bigger and bigger question. Help us understand exactly how you've been getting by month to month with this hardship. Michael? Uh, okay, so I'll repeat that. What if it's, uh, uh, you know, so now we're getting into some scenarios that, that are kind of what ifs, but what if it's uh, a person gets temporarily ill during that first few months of employment when they're in their probationary period? A person, if terminated during that period of time, is not eligible for unemployment. So now let's talk a little bit about uh, this this change you've heard about, the change to the underemployment hardship test. Uh, now, let's recognize that, uh, so the, the deal is now, you must uh, document that a person's income has decreased at least 10% from, uh, you know, the, the income that they used to receive. And let's recognize, this is very important to the way that you proceed uh, with uh, your qualification work <coughs> Like, let's recognize there's actually three different scenarios uh, that a person might find themselves in when they're unemployed, or rather underemployed. 
Uh, some people who are underemployed have the same employer that they have had for, for some time now, uh, but their hours and their wages, therefore, have been, uh, and their income has been reduced because because of what? Because, you know, um, maybe in a case like this, the employer says, oh, you know, business is not as good as it used to be. I, just, I simply need to cut back on your hours. Sometimes a uh, applicant is underemployed because they lost an old, well-paying job. They were unemployed for a little while. Um, and when they were um, uh, unemployed, they, they were getting unemployment benefits. But then they got reemployed. Unfortunately, their new job doesn't pay as much as the old job used to. And then one final scenario is, is very similar to that. Someone loses an old job, they don't get unemployment benefits, but now they have a new job, okay? So I wanna tackle, in the next three slides, I wanna tackle each of these scenarios in turn to give you guidance on how you're gonna handle that. And recognize, in each of these three scenarios, the same key concept comes up. In each of these scenarios, we have to figure out how to show that this underemployment was at no fault of their own, okay? Because that's recognized. If a person was fired from their old job and got a new, less well-paying job, they're at fault for losing that first job. So, first scenario, the same employer but reduced hours. The first question to ask is, well, what's their income? And let's compare that to what the income used to previously be. And you can document that by looking at pay stubs, by looking at W-2 tax statements, and you can compare now to then, okay? But secondly, you have to document that whole business of were you at fault or at no fault. And you would do that uh, very simply with a letter from your employer stating, hey, the loss of income was not the fault of the employee. Second scenario, though. What if you have a new employer after having received unemployment benefits? Well, the first thing to do is to verify that the person had received unemployment benefits. Remember, as in the past, we look to the, the current system for at the, that the Unemployment Benefits Office uses. They already have a system that they've been using for decades to determine if a person is eligible for unemployment or not, whether they're at fault for having lost their job or not. If a person receives unemployment benefits, it's our confirmation they were not at fault for having lost their job. And you'll see the second bullet point, very much like what you just saw on the last slide. Verify their current and their past income using pay stubs, W-2 statements. Third scenario, what if a person has a new employer, never received unemployment benefits <coughs> during the period when they were unemployed? Now. You can't just simply document the unemployment benefits they received. Instead, you're going to have to get some letter, some verification from a third party, very likely the past employer, uh, to indicate, look, they lost that original job through no fault of their own. And then the rest is the same. Document current and past income based on pay stubs and W-2 statements. So fairly similar situations here, and that's how you would handle each of them in turn. Now, what I summarized here in three slides, that's one of the changes that you'll see in your hardest hit manual. So, uh, so you, got, you got two documents that, uh, that give you guidance on these situations dealing with underemployment. So that was all, boy, that was a mouthful, but that was all step number three, addressing the changes to eligibility criteria. So let's say that the applicant that you're working on, who had been formally declared ineligible, now you're like, oh, it's all coming together. It looks like they're income eligible. It looks like they pass all the eligibility tests. And so now you're to step number four, where you're, you're now exporting a case up to Florida Housing's underwriting staff. Now, make sure that when you export that case uh, that you're including a signed eligibility checklist. This is your way of showing the underwriter that you didn't just look at the eligibility criteria that have changed. You holistically looked at all the eligibility criteria, and you can say with certainty 
they pass all of the eligibility tests. That's critical, you know? We're putting so much focus on the hardest hit changes that we've been talking about here, but before you export a case, you have to do what you've always done before you exported a case. You've got to be confident yourself that they pass all the tests. Now here's a screenshot of what it looks like when an advisor export a, exports a case using Counselor Direct. And I want to draw your attention to the, the, the red circle on the bottom here. Normally, in the past, when we export a new application, uh, a new applicant's case, we will um, we'll go right here and we'll check every single one of the uploaded documents. Right? That's the, that's the process that we have been using now. And we have been pushing this button right here that says export package. Export all of the documents that I've uploaded. But now, let's recognize, for somebody who was declared ineligible in the past, you've already collected lots of documents from them. And now you're coming back and you're collecting new documents from them, which have a new naming convention. So you only want to send the new documents. Okay, so you'll have to forgive me. This screenshot right here uh, certainly does not have documents with the new naming convention. But I did want to give you a visual to, to remind you that, you know, this is what it looks like when you export. There's a whole list of documents. Probably your list is going to be even longer, right? Because you're going to have old documents and you're going to have new documents. You need to check off all the new documents and then you need to press that button, export files only as in export only the files that I've selected to send to the underwriter, okay? So that's a little unusual uh, for exporting a case. I mean, there's been situations where you've had to do that in the past. Whenever you submit a monthly touch, for example, you do this, but definitely we need to do this now. Beyond that, there's really not that much that's changed about exporting a case. And so on the receiving end over at Florida Housing, there's not really all that much that distinguishes uh, exporting a new applicant from exporting a formally ineligible case. Oh, here's a question from somebody. I once was ineligible, but now am HHF funded. Congratulations, sir. How much is my advisor paid? Well, that is very sweet of you to ask. How much is the advisor paid? Well, a variety of uh, amounts. Uh, first of all, for collecting this new information to prove that this person's now eligible, the advisor agency is going to get $150. We talked about that a little earlier. Uh, also, this person who's never received hardest hit assistance before, they do need to close on their loan, so there's going to be a $100 payment for that. And then, you know, on the day of closing, that's when the advisor is going to do the first quarterly touch, they'll get paid $150 for that, and then every three months, they get paid another $150 for each uh, next quarterly touch that they perform. Okay? Ooh, yes, sir, in the back. You got a question? How about me? I was ineligible, and it turns out I still am. So how much is your advisor going to get paid for that? Nothing. Okay? That's, that's the deal. You got to figure out some system to efficiently and quickly determine of all those who were formerly ineligible, which ones are eligible now and which ones are not. Because you're not going to get compensated for any of the time you spend on folks who are still ineligible. All right. I want to also recognize, what about, what about this guy right here? You know, he st turns out he's still ineligible. It begs the question, after, you know, let's say he came to us and was like, hey, would you check, you know, I heard that hardest hit has changed. Would you now check to see if now I'm eligible? So you do a little bit of check-in, and you're like, no, you're still ineligible. It begs the question, do we send another ineligible letter to this person? And the answer is often no. Often, you're going to find that they're ineligible for the same reasons why they were ineligible before. But what about a new scenario? What if a person was deemed um, ineligible because of their mortgage origination date? Okay? Um, and now we know that that criteria has been eliminated. So on the surface of it, you think, oh, you know, this person's eligible. But as you're talking with them, you find out they now have an act of bankruptcy or some other thing that, that puts them out of the program. So they're ineligible, 
but they're ineligible for a new reason. And if they're ineligible for a new reason, you will send them a second ineligible letter. Okay? You'll go back to that same ineligible letter generator tab that's on Counselor Direct. Here's a screenshot of the bottom of that form. And, uh, and you'll, you know, you'll type in, the re you know, check mark the, all the reasons why they're ineligible now. Notice where I've highlighted with a red circle here, there's a new item at the bottom of that list. And it says re-verification date. Okay? So this is something you type in the date when you're sending a second ineligible letter. And by typing a date into that box, it's your way of telling Florida Housing and Counselor Direct, this is my second ineligible letter that I'm sending out. So that's good news. You know, if a person's deemed ineligible and you're not getting paid any money for having done any reevaluation of them, the last thing you want to do is to have to mail out another letter to them. You don't have to do that unless they're ineligible for some new reason.